Okay, we are live. So, hello everyone. I assume we are live now. Um, hello? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we hear you. Yes. Thank you. So welcome everyone to today's session and thank you very much for uh, Frank Bürgen and Horazis to um, set up this conference and uh, we are looking forward for a lively conversation uh, on the topic America's future of work. So this is a big topic that is not just only for the United States but I think generally around the world. What does it mean? What happened uh, especially during the times of the pandemic um, to this new paradigm and how we can uh, have a new way of work, the future of work, what impacts will it have, uh, the distance that it implies that workplaces went away uh, and moved to home. Um, then the question on all the digitalization, what does it mean, what is the human factor attached, how can that work together. So these are very critical points. And at the end of the day, how will it impact all of us and society when we move forward, being in the work environment, being in the private, where is the overlap, and can you really manage that, and what is the impact in the day to day. But before we start uh, going into all these details, I would uh, like to um, open the, um, the floor and the discussion, but first of all, I would like the uh, speakers uh, to present them quickly um, and uh, where they come from, what their background is, and uh, what the purpose is for them being on the, this conference. Ladies first, we start with Molly. Good morning. Um, my name is Molly Conway. I'm with the Adeco Group, which is the world leading talent advisory and solutions company. Um, our mission is to make the future work for everyone. So I'm very excited to be here and discuss these important topics. Um, in this, I hope, post-pandemic world, it's now more important than ever to maintain sight of and foster a positive culture and strong values in the workplace. Prior to joining the Adeco Group last April, I spent about 14 years working for the government in the House, Senate, and Executive Branch, all in the labor and employment space. Thank you very much, Molly. Kathleen. Hi, thanks for having us this morning. Uh, I'm uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, along with Molly, and I run a national nonprofit here in the U.S. Uh, that's called the Education Design Lab. So we're focused on, on redesigning the school-to-work journey as a more inclusive, lifelong journey. So one that moves away from degrees as the proxy for hiring uh, to one skills-based learning, which a lot of employers are embracing um, in part because uh, they have to, because of the great resignation, uh, because of uh, the uh, en enrollment cliff in colleges that is coming, at least in this country, uh, they are finding it harder to find the talent that they're looking for. And so they're willing to look uh, at, um, at alternative uh, pipeline um, and it's so we believe that COVID and the changes that have happened in the school to work um, um, uh, pipeline have, through COVID have really actually benefited um, uh, those what we call new majority learners and learners, those who have been excluded from a lot of uh, professional yeah. track jobs. And Michael. Michael Drexler, Chief Strategy Officer at Bright Star Capital Partners based in Palm Beach, Florida. Um, we're a private equity firm with about $3 billion under management that invests in U.S.-based middle market companies. And so we understand the environment both from urban centers perspective like New York, but also across the whole country. And we work with businesses that have been filled by founders, families and entrepreneurs where leg legacy matters a lot. And so workforce culture is a critical part of this. For us, three trends in the pandemic uh, combination of physical and digital, not either or, but both, uh, the importance of being local, and finally, the importance of listening to your workforce and making it a two-way conversation rather than a one-way broadcast. Back to you, Matthias. Brilliant. So, uh, at last, because speakers always first, uh, I'm Matthias Ernst, the founder and CEO of Ascenso Futura International. Uh, we have two lines of business. One is um, 
We sit on family boards, uh, do family governance. I'm also a fellow of the Family Firm Institute of Boston, Massachusetts. And on the other hand, we have a private equity participation business for our family. Um, so we look carefully at the trends because it has an impact on the businesses itself, also on the businesses you participate or invest in. So we want to make sure that the employability for the workforce, the change, the trends, because you can have the best strategies if you don't, if you don't have the people that follow you, you will have a problem because you might have the best strategies, concepts, they're all out there, but there are studies that only 20% of all these concepts really hit reality. Um, so maybe starting with Molly is um, when we talk about leadership or being a manager, that's a difference. Leadership doesn't necessarily is just being a manager. It holds true for government, holds true in business leaders, and and it's also the whole story, I guess, on why am I doing that? What is the purpose behind it, and how can we manage it? So the question is the change in the in the future for the workforce. How would you see that from one of the, I would even argue with a decade the, the leader in the market? So if you look at it. Uh, what is your what are your thoughts about that future of work, leadership, managing? How do you see that from your day to day business? Absolutely. I mean, I could talk about this for hours, but I'll try to keep it brief. Um, last year, we unveiled the results of our latest study called Reset Normal, where we defined the new era of uh, work. It examined attitudes um, and how they've changed and the implications for companies to successfully adapt to this period of transition. So one of the things that um, came out of that was we hear about empathy and leadership. I think we've all read articles about it. It's something that has really become um, come to the forefront this year and the end of last. And I think we can all agree that it's necessary, but what does it really mean? Um, I recently read a Fast Company article um, that made a good point. It discussed empathy versus compassion, whereas people now, especially in this post-COVID world, they want meaningful action and not just words. So in other words, employees and prospective talent want employers who walk the talk, um, providing this purpose-driven, compassionate leadership. So those are, those are really, really important right now in the leadership space. Um, and I'll turn it back to you, and I can always come back and speak more on this topic. Really, but maybe just one follow-up on the, on the topic of empathy is empathy is also a KPI for leading companies, uh, listed companies more and more, that they say, okay, why is somebody promoted? Why is not the other one promoted? Not even independently of the skill set. So how important are what people said maybe years ago, soft skills or the empathy, the, 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 the company culture? I mean, I just anticipate listening to the workforce. That was one of the things Michael said in his introduction. How do you interact? How is this purpose and how much empathy that you really want to go to work and you want to do this job because you see a purpose in it? How big is empathy as a driver for the future or an accelerator? Well, when I was speaking of empathy, I meant it more from a leadership perspective. But I think the three factors for what employees are looking for um, in the new workplace are flexibility, well-being and mental health support and to purpose. And the purpose, again, going back to what does my company stand for? Do I agree with their values? Do I like my culture? Do I like my colleagues? Um, something you know that has been talked about a lot is the great resignation, but we like to call it the great reevaluation because it's not just people leaving their jobs and sitting at home all day. It's people leaving their jobs because they aren't happy or they don't like what they're doing or they are unhappy with their employer or their employer's not listening. So those are really, I think, the three drivers that we're seeing for um, people making employment changes and, you know, deciding whether or not they are going to stay with their employer. And the three things that employers need to keep in mind as far as retaining and attracting new talent. Mm -hmm. Talent. Talent means you need a certain skill set. And in the past, we were thinking about, um, I'm saying in the past, I think still, um, you need to have a certain degree. Then you do college, university, you do a bachelor, you do a master, you go. So there's a certain pathway to get 
promoted uh, in the job of uh, being an entrepreneur yourself. So, so it's like a ticket. You, you, you go up the ladder. And I think Kathleen has a different view on it. And uh, also one of the big multinationals is doing that uh, with three letters. So if you can talk a little bit about that um, and, and how you envision this, so to speak, um, lifelong learning uh, journey uh, from a different perspective. Always please in the perspective, Kathleen, America's future of work. Great. Well, thank you. And I, I wanted to uh, just touch on empathy because uh, you all were just talking about it. And uh, that's a great example of the kind of skill that people have not been hired for in the past. And you know, starting in about 2014, uh, the lab, my organization, uh, started responding to uh, demand really from employers and from learners and, and colleges who were helping them uh, to uh, to turn turn empathy and uh, communications and all the soft skills resilience, uh, collaboration into credentials that they could earn and demonstrate mastery and competency of, and then, you know, show them to employers to either get hired or get promoted. So we've been working on, on basically um, skillifying soft skills for about seven or eight years. And, and one thing I thought would be interesting to note here is that during, uh, during and after COVID, the top, we always um, uh, work with employers to say, what are the top two or three soft skills that you want to hire against. And it used before the pandemic, it was communications, collaboration, and critical thinking, the three C's. And after now, over the past year or two, when we work with employers, the top two are resilience and empathy, which I think is, is an interesting shift. Um, but, but just to answer your specific question about this, this framework that we're trying to help people embrace or help employers embrace, and colleges really, is this idea of the weave that you can learn and work, um, whether you're in college or, 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 or any kind of training program, even a boot camp, right? Whether you're in a learning mode or whether you're in a work mode, that what employees want, to Molly's point, is a, a sort of a constant weave of learning and applying that learning, getting credit for the things they can do and not just the things they got a piece of paper for in a degree. And so that's, uh, we call that the weave, um, but it's, um, it is, that concept is really taking hold and largely because um, of the, you know, of the talent shortages. And so employers are looking for ways to, you know, look at the talent they have and say, how can I upskill this group to look out at, you know, very unusual or maybe non-traditional um, uh, sources and say, how can I, how can I validate the skills that these people already have? Because I need, I need workers. But the thing in here, uh, just an add-on on that, when you say we have, well, the, the famous skill, set anal the skill gap analysis, so you have the skill gap analysis, so, so you need to, over a decade, people lose their skills. It depends on the specific industry, but if you don't re-educate the people in a fast-moving world, in specific industries faster than in others, you will basically lose out and you will be out of job or you can, for whatever reason, not even follow or get promoted. Now, when you say that it's a skill based and and so the, the degrees is not that important. So that's pretty much big shift in in the perspective of looking at the, the traditional paths on how also the educational system is organized in, in principle, the universities, the schools and all that. So how big would you consider the risk if somebody says, well, I do that from an academic, academic standpoint, how to address problems from an academic perspective, how to solve them, how to, with different dis uh, disciplines, different academic routes, how can you combine them how can you do that without having a degree so that they are still recognized? How do you bridge that gap and over what period of time that this model that you propose mm -hmm. really works in the day to day? If the head of HR says, well, but you don't have the degree, you need a master for that position. Right. You are qualified, but I'm sorry, you don't have the, the degree. Right. Um, in fact, uh, uh, President Biden uh, was was scheduled to mention this topic in, in his uh, State of the Union address the other night. Um, I think the Ukraine, uh, it, it was certainly in all the press coming beforehand where he is was doing what Trump uh, had done before him, which was to say, we are going to start setting an example at the federal level, trying to hire 
uh, not require degrees for as many positions as is possible. The, you know, the place where it is still required really uh, are, would be regulated industries, right, where um, like we were talking to PwC and they said, OK, the CPA exam, strictly speaking, you don't have to have a degree, but you have to pass a test, which the degree is basically prep for. Um, and so, you know, there, there are many there are many fields, law, medicine, nursing, teaching, where um, what I'm describing is harder to execute. But there are mm-hmm. many of the new fields um, is where is where it's really taking hold, whether it's cyber or um, data analysis, um, you know, any kind of marketing or um, uh, project management are just a couple of good examples. And all of the trades, um, which had traditionally not required degrees, but might require a degree to be a manager of tradespeople. So, so when we look in the future, we can say that when we have a transformation, so we have a transformation if we take climate change away from the carbon industry based to, to others. So there might be new jobs coming. Digitalization, there might be new jobs coming. Cybercrime protection might be new jobs coming. And in this, this part of the industry, besides the traditional industries that still require the degrees. So for those emerging jobs or the jobs we don't even know what will be out there in five to ten years, not necessarily this must be then the traditional qualification lever on, on the things. Now, talking digitalization and, and, and global and, and then to the local workforce and how can that work together, especially when jobs were moved to home, and you need to manage a team, you need to manage a company, and you don't see them every day in the office. So, so it's a different way on leadership management, how to get them engaged, being local, being a global company. So these are all difficult things. And um, Michael, uh, when you look at this, you mentioned the three points that you affirm and you personally are looking at. Maybe if you could elaborate a little bit on that human factor, digitalization, away, home, managing, um, please. So I mean, to, to some, the absence of the boss might actually be a good thing. And so uh, it, it, it really comes down to that human factor. And I, mm-hmm. I think uh, my co-panelists have said it very well earlier, as have you. Em- empathy is just one of these really critical skills. And when you, when you say, how are you at the beginning of a, of a business meeting, you can either mean it just as a way to pass a second and then get on to the real stuff, or you can we can actually really ask it in a caring way. And I, I think we've seen some of that happening during the pandemic uh, where we, we just started to see each other more as humans, even or particularly over Zoom, because we're taking these calls from our homes. We see the kids running around in the background and it, make, it makes actually for a better connection in a way. And so I think this is a good example of how digital actually augments the physical and uh, gives us a new way of looking at things. And then, of course, we then uh, go and see people in person again, and and that even enhances the connection further. But it all has to start with managers, colleagues, all of us uh, caring about the other much more than probably we have done in the past. And I think we we move away from this transactional leadership to more mission driven leadership because again, in and that's why the military places so much emphasis on mission because if if everyone knows what they're doing and everyone cares what they're doing, then the role of leadership becomes much softer, much more coaching, much more every now and then coming in with a nudge or an advice as opposed to standing behind people like some of us in consulting have seen in our early days where you have the classic manager hovering over the associate and watching every move that was made in the spreadsheet and mm-hmm. it's of course super uncomfortable and and that's not the lo- local or physical leadership we want back so when we when we maybe go for for a little journey now uh, molly kathleen and and Michael, when we say, okay, Molly, flexibility, purpose-driven, the three major points that you see from the study, Kathleen, with a new way of looking at things, Michael, with that, what you just mentioned, um, we have a new generation, the 20 years plus, or even the younger ones. They enter into the workforce. This generation, Ypsilon, said they think different. They think on purpose. They think on why am I doing that? So where I like to focus maybe uh, on the next couple of minutes is 
we talk about the existing workforce. What about this workforce that is coming in that comes from most of them, or at least there's a clear trend that they, this generation has a different look at the world, a different look at purposes, what they want to do, why are they doing it? And how would we address that? So like the new model that you mentioned that you want to push forward, Kathleen, the studies that you know, and, and you, Michael, uh, Molly and Michael. So each of you, brief, how would you, do you see that as a big chance? For me personally, I think it's a big chance. If you want to have change, this is a tremendous opportunity. And I think also from my personal perspective, if human resources management, that's a key turning point. If, if there is not something to, that is really changing that industry and the whole industry, we need very good people in that, in that field that really understands how to do the transformation with all the things that happened um, in this world on human resources management. So how can we bridge that gap of the young generation coming in with the uh, characteristics on how they look at life and that what we just discussed before? Molly. Um, I'm just looking for our um, we part of our report. I'll, I'll find it later. Actually, looked at the different generations from this incoming generation. I don't even remember what they're called to the baby boomers and what is most important to them, the factors that are most important to them, and how they would choose a job or a career based on those factors. So I will find that in a moment. Um, but I think it, it all goes back to uh, just to bring it back to empathy and to thinking and to realizing that you need to stay three steps ahead and that you need to realize what your workforce wants, what your workforce needs and meet them where they're at. Um, it's no longer a one size fits all approach, but um, I'll look for those, that data and get back to you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I could add here, Matthias, um, to su suggest that um, I, I have a lot of employees who are in the, in the, let's say 25 to you know 45 category and, and I'm the parent of uh, two, you know, late twenty-something workers, and and what 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 we observe and what we're trying to key our model into is this idea that that workers of these generations, they they see their career as more as wanting to be in the cloud rather than on the ladder, and and by that I mean um, that they have skills they want to be known for and they want to be very good at them. Um, and they want to be able to control their life to offer these skills in different ways. And often uh, we see like some of our best people are refusing to be on staff full time, right? They want to do the things they want to do and pick and choose the projects they work on. So they want to be in our talent cloud and be available for projects. And they feel they're earning, you know, fine. They don't care about the latter and you know, getting to the next management um, management stage. So we've tried to construct our organization in a way that um, that that houses both ladder climbers and cloud participants, and it's it's working pretty well. It's very tough on the manager; it requires more skill uh, for the managers um, because they've got some people who are in in the tent and some people who are outside the tent, and they're having to put teams together all the time. Michael. Yeah, I, I, I would caution a little bit uh, against over stereotyping on these things because uh, stereotypes, of course, can be useful. But, you know, if you had told me three years ago that uh, everyone would be working from home and that it would work, uh, I probably would have raised an eyebrow or two. And, of course, uh, history has shown it can work. And in a sense, we're all, quote, entitled millennials now. And so I think... Uh, a little bit of stereotyping is always helpful, but it really comes down to what people want. And through the pandemic, I think a lot of people, which drives the great resignation, have woken up and said, you know, life is actually quite short. And I hadn't thought of this. And this horrible pandemic made me focus on it. And now I'm going to renegotiate with myself and my family and my employer the balance between work and the rest of this short life. And and that's okay as employers. We have to respect that and we have to engage with people. And younger people, I find, sometimes have a slightly different skill set because they've been exposed to certain things a bit more, particularly around technology. But overall, they're still people. They, they're trying to live a fulfilled life. And 
to me, good leadership and good management means understanding that for your workforce and over stereotyping means we will then apply the wrong template because I'm, I'm sure there are millennials who want a steady job and want the career ladder, ladder because it gives them some security and there, and there are cloud uh, workers uh, who are 50 plus years old and, and understanding that is actually all we need to do. But to your point, Kathleen, it doesn't make management easier, but you know what? Managers get paid more money than <laughs> usual workers and they got to earn it. That, that's okay. If we look at, we want to have a good life and we want to uh, be well and we want to be happy in the work and different generations have different approaches. We try to frame it. So we have the regulator framing things. We have the business side framing things. We have supporters from the consulting play, which all business, of course, but, you know, framing this new world and seeing it now. We have, I want to throw that out to, to, to the three of you. Um, we have the digitalization on one hand, and we have the analog world. We have the, our reality. So, so the digitalization helps us, right, in our day-to-day -day life. If it's helping, that's fine. But there is a certain pivotal point where we all don't know where it really is because it's pretty individual, where this constantly, somebody can call me, constantly I need to look at a phone or, or a computer and check my email. Constantly, I'm, if, if something, internet doesn't work, I'm, I'm done. So, so the digitalization is overwhelming. A lot of people also have a big fear and say, well, it's part of my life, but it's also negatively impacting me. So the human factor and the ongoing digitalization, all that we will have in 10, 20, 30 years, which we most likely don't even know. So how would that change? Our topic is America's future of work. How would that change? Or do we need to focus on certain things that we say, okay, it's important so that we can do that, what we do right now, we are in different places, we can do that. The technology helped us, but where comes, as it was mentioned in the last half an hour, uh, the human factor, empathy, all these factors are key. So how can we bridge these two sides and how do you envision from that perspective the future? Now we start with Michael and we go back. So um, this, this one is obviously not easy, but to me it comes down to ultimately trust and respect and, and a grown-up attitude between particularly employer and employee, because that's where a lot of this happens in the short term. So to give an example, if um, I work at one of the car auctions that we own and I, I work on a system that is literally 30 years old and it's looked like these old things that we've seen at the travel agent and you put a letter on the screen and then the computer does something so you don't even have a mouse to run these systems. <laughs> Some of our employees actually really love it. And as we dug into this, as we bought the company, why they love it, we found out they love it because no one else can do the job. They've learned all the shortcuts. And so they view these antiquated systems as a job insurance. And as we unpack that, of course, we, we realized we can't upgrade those systems until we take those employees along with us. And how do you do that? You say, well, this is actually not about your job or about rationalizing you. This is about making you more productive and your job more pleasant. And it's easy said, but it takes a long time to actually make it work and so employees trust you and believe that. And I think the whole digitization comes down to a very simple concept. It introduces a lot of change. Change can be a threat to people if it's framed as transactional, as robotic, as automatic. And it can be a huge uh, benefit to people if it's framed as uh, enabling and enhancing. But all of this has to come from a sense of safety about and respect, uh, back to our previous conversation, from the employer to the employee. And again, active listening on both sides, saying, I'm the employer. Here is what I need from you, the employee, to run my business. And very transparently, uh, very transparently. And then flip side, I'm the employee. 
here is what I need from you as an employer to live my life in a meaningful way. And to me, the great resignation is a lot about negotiating that in the face of a lot of uncertainty. Other than that, uh, you know, technology has always been there. It's always changed jobs. And, you know, in, in 1910, when I was a blacksmith for horses, I had a really uh, in-demand and safe job. And then Henry Ford came along and life looked differently. But a lot of the blacksmiths went into car factories and manufactured or went into metal manufacturing. The, the answer is we don't know yet what the new jobs will look like. And I think as employers, we've got to be honest about that and say they will be there, but don't ask us what exactly they are because we don't know ourselves. That creates trust as well. If I may, just a follow up on that, Michael. Now you have a business, you digitalize it, you have 100 employees, now you only need 60. Okay? So you can't fire 40 or let them go with negotiation, with contracts whatsoever. What I'm just saying is the, the, the employee, he wants to have a good life, he wants to do that, and he wants to have a work-life balance, resignation, all this. Okay. But if you look at the employer, he says, okay, if you don't perform that, we need to run a business. The competition is not that easy. You need to reskill. Not just only having a good life. I'm sorry, I will have to let you go. Mm -hmm. So, and if I need less people for maybe the same job, there might be new jobs, but you need to reskill for them and we need to go to that direction. So it cannot just be the rose garden for, for one side of the equation. You said negotiation. So how big would you see the conflict here if the business is not capable to create new jobs in the time frame when digitalization is running fast, mm -hmm. then you can have, you want to have a good life and the beauty and I want to, you know, but at the end of the day, they need to make money to survive in order and grow in order to make the job. So this conflict, mm -hmm. um, how do you see that on a timeline? So this, this is where private equity is, is a great place to be because we like to grow companies. And the, the first thing you mentioned from 100 to, 100 to 60 is what the economists call the fixed labor fallacy that uh, right. for a certain output, I only need a, a certain amount of labor and that stays constant. And the answer is when you grow the company fast enough, uh, in, in particularly companies that are privately held or family held, that growth usually outpaces the yeah. rationalization. However, um, that negotiation has to happen. It's, it's part of life. And here is my view. It's not easy to have that negotiation, but it's still a lot easier to have than to make assumptions about the workforce and not tell them what you need. And a lot of large companies we, we see, they basically assume their workforce is lazy. They never ask their workforce whether they're actually lazy and want to have a good life. It's just an assumption, and that drives the labor relationships, and that's why those large companies are not such a fun place to work, and then they wonder why the employees leave. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, Molly, uh, initial question was about um, digitalization, human touch, and all this. How do you see that? Great. Well, um, I think that we need to keep in mind that Technology and digitalization are meant to streamline and create efficiencies for humans. We have always and will always remain an important piece of the equation. We drive the technology. Um, we interpret the technology. We use it to create better human connection. But we ask most sorry. We must also circle back to skills. It is really important to you know Catherine Kathleen's points from earlier. Um, we need to be continually equipped with the right skill set to apply and advance the technology. This is hard and soft skills. Um, and so we need to keep that in mind when, when, we're, when we're thinking about this as employers, as colleagues. Um, but, you know, on the flip side, we talk about technology and um, this new digitalization brought on by the pandemic. But in some ways, it created more authentic relationships and showed people the human side lines blurred between home and work life um, to Michael's point about, you know, kids running around in the background or in my case, FedEx man always shows up while I'm on a call and the dogs mm -hmm. start barking. Um, but people are craving this human interaction um, and maybe they miss a little bit of the water cooler gossip act, uh, aspect of being at work, but 
now they want it on own terms. And I think that's important to keep in mind. Um, we can do all of the polling we want and you know, you pull the right people and they'll say, well, I want to work four days a week. Well, that might not work for some people. Some people may rather work shorter days, five days a week. Um, then other people, and I think I would fall in this category, would rather have a, like, a set of deliverables, exactly what I need to do, and I get it done when, by the time it's due, but on my own terms. And so I think that's very important to keep in mind that we can, um, we can do all of the, the studies and asking um, everyone what they think, but at the end of the day, it really comes down to meeting your employees where they're at as long as they're not interested. Brilliant. Thank you. Catherine. Um, well, I actually wanted to mention uh, a way that we're trying to kind of help create the dignity and the, the human, not so, so much the human touch, but the ability to access these markets. Because one of the things that the digitalization has done is I kind of created a new job divide, you know, and we all saw it in the pandemic, right? The, the folks, and they mostly fell in the category of um, underserved community members who had to physically go to work because they didn't have digitally enabled jobs, um, and they and they you know the economy relied on them to you know be uh, be at the grocery work at the grocery store or in the hospital or be our police people and et cetera. So um, you know I was trying to think as as you all were talking about how does the how does the digitalization, um, which is in some ways so empowering for the way we work, it it, it leaves that that whole crowd is 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 left. Uh, in the cold, in, in in at least to the for the part that says, oh, now it's on my terms, you know, because it's not on their terms, and so and I think that's one of the reasons so many people left jobs in restaurants, etc. So so that's very interesting um, and something that you know we we've got to figure out how to how to empower that um, that sector of of the workforce as well. And that's what I wanted to say. We in the in the last couple of minutes. Um, we like to have a takeaway, right? So that's what we all want to give to the audience. And uh, as you just said, what we need to look at, Kathleen, and what we need to do. Now, when we look at the future of work from your different perspective, right? So, so Michael has financial background as well. Me is me too. Uh, Molly from your background. Kathleen from your background. So, money is important that we channel also the investments into education and that we do that in the skill for. So in the companies or as an external financier like private equity firms or private investors or whatsoever, family owned businesses do that because of the values they, they see for their family and also for the businesses. And this is patient money, long-term money. And when we do a transformation, I think that's a very Nice money you want to have, kind of money you want to have, not a transactional or, or, or exit-driven money. So that's one thing. Now, what is the key takeaway, maybe one or two, that you want to give the audience by saying, okay, America's future of work, what is one or two points that the people should maybe think about, Right. So let's go the same round as the beginning. Mom. Great. Um, my takeaway would be purpose-driven business and leadership are more important now than ever. It's a movement. It's an awakening. It's not going anywhere anytime soon. Um, and companies need to continually adapt, evolve, and think several steps ahead to attract and retain talent. So would you go, maybe just as an example, would you go and then also with your organization that you push new initiatives, uh, have new plans uh, as an organization, you saying, okay, we are looking for two, five, ten years planning, or is this too far, or is it more hands-on approach? So how to execute that? Right. I think... Uh, maybe we can look two years out, but I wouldn't go any further than two years out. Um, we really, I mean, no one predicted the pandemic. No one predicted what would come. Right. So we just need to stay nimble and on our on our toes and, and continue to be active listeners and understand what, what our workforce needs and what we need to provide them. Um, but not, not try to come up with a rigid plan now that 
may not work in five or ten years. Okay, good. Okay. I'd like to leave uh, folks with um, a concept. Um, we're looking for advocates and feedback on this concept that we're calling X credit, which is experience credit. And Walmart.org is funding a laboratory to develop this concept with us. And it's it's really the notion that the skills you already have that you could get credit and that in, in terms of validation for hiring in the hiring market um, by by either taking an assessment or having a an employer um, you know uh, translate that this counts for this many years of experience um, um, it's really a way to help folks who who don't have the traditional degrees uh, to get credit for the things they can do rather than where they went to school or they know and uh, it's 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 gaining a little bit of steam it's early days but we're looking at you know any anyone reach out who uh, wants to be um, you know that we can talk about it more and Help people learn about it, but it's uh, it's a it's a little movement that we're trying to grow. X credit with the Education Design Lab. Thank you, Michael. So I think number one, work will be a lot more flexible, uh, a lot less stereotypical than in the past, uh, a lot more augmented by digital, which we've we've belabor a lot in in this session, and and I think that's for real. And I think in the balance of labor and capital, uh, this is shifting back to labor a bit. And that's actually a, a very good thing in, in, in my view. And I say this as a capitalist and a mm -hmm. finance person, but I think we've, we've gone the wrong side of the pendulum for a bit too long running up to this crisis. Um, I, I think, and then the last thing we, we talked a lot about is I hope that the dialogue will become less adversarial and more understanding and that the pandemic has taught us that that employers and employees actually are on the same side of the equation and not opposing sides of the equation. Follow up on that. You work with family-owned businesses. So when we look at, uh, we um, we have about, um, I mean, I'm a fellow of an institute in Boston where we look at this too at, uh, in, on the family side. So when we have 70 or let it be 80%. In Germany, I'm German, it's 90% of the business are fairly owned the family control. So they pay, uh, they, they are an important part. So how can you concretely, in the execution of that, what you just say, what you can you influence concretely with families, within their values, that you can help them through capital to make a transformation on the value values that they have it funded from their own money or in per investment or new technology, new educational platform, new initiatives, that you push that forward. Um, so maybe on that direction, how is the concrete impact and how long will that take? So I, I think a lot of it is ingrained, a lot of it is, is long term. And, and to me, the concept with these businesses in particular is legacy. And it's a very simple question. Do you want your business, which is part of what you've built, to be remembered for uh, strikes, acrimonious worker relationships, mass layoffs, or do you want your business to be remembered for being very productive in collaboration with your workforce? And usually the moment you mention the word legacy to any family business owner, the, the lights go on and you almost don't have to say any more. And I wish we would have some of that uh, in non-family run businesses. Of course, there are some. Um, and I think that's where sustainability and ESG will actually help us and be a huge tailwind. If I may add, it's all I, at the end of the day, what we look at in our company is that we look at the value chain within the family. We hope to keep, let's say, fourth generation sibling consortium also together, depending how big they are, uh, so that they are all on the same page. Now, finally, in, maybe in the last two minutes, it is when we look critically at a topic there are different opinions. We touched on a lot of it, I guess. But for me, what I take away is the glass is half full, right? So it's not on a negative, oh, we have the pandemic, now digitalization, human capital is down, difficult and all this. So what I take away from you, Molly, from Kathleen, from you, Michael, and, and uh, so I'm convinced that we can leave it on a positive note that when we organize it properly, when we engage 
from a regulatory standpoint and also from the different stakeholders that we interact, I think we have a big chance and maybe there must be some other more organized platforms that the different stakeholders on qualifications, skill sets can work together like we have that, for example, for climate now, recently now in this week with the, with the plastic in Nairobi. Maybe we have like a more movement because it's not just about the, uh, the future of America's workforce. I think it's the future of the workforce in general because we have a cross-border and the only thing that really can go across borders um, are businesses. Uh, they can easily move borders. So overall, uh, if we leave that on a positive note, I think um, we have hopefully contributed uh, on this conference uh, on not just America's uh, future, but also on all the different aspects we, we said. So I would say overall, that's it from my side. I think we are uh, at the time. We have reached the time. So I thank Horazis again and Frank for giving the opportunity. I thank you, Molly. Thank you, Kathleen. And thank you, Michael, for your insights. And I thank uh, all the attendants uh, to our conversation. And as you all well know, this will be recorded and you can watch it later. And hopefully you had some interesting insights. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.